how good we are in ten subjects, your blood and grace is always real. It is through your abundant mercy and love, I and your great love and kindness, that I shall come to your house. I shall humbly bow towards your holy temple and holy fear of you. O Lord, I love your house and the place where your glory dwells. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our mind our maker. To you, eternal one, we pray. May this be a time of your favor. O oh God, with your abundant kindness, answer us for the truth of your salvation.
Rejoice in His presence. His name is more exalted than all blessing and praise. Blessed be His name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. Let the name of the Lord be blessed forever and ever. Amen. You are holy, and your name is holy. And holy ones praise your name daily, forever. Blessed are you, Adonai, eternal God and King. Show favor on our God to your people Israel and their prayer. And return the service of the Holy of Holies of your Israel and their prayer. And return the service of the Holy of Holies of your temple. The fire offered to Israel and their prayer, accept in love and favor. And may the service of your people Israel be eternally favorable to you. May our eyes see you turn to Zion in compassion. Blessed are you, God, who returns his presence to Zion. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shemcheo, Mahuto, Le'olam Ba'ayin. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and blessed be his name, whose glory is kingdom, is forever and ever. Shabbat Shalom. 
City of Lufkin and the city of Nacogdoches. I've had.
הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא רחמים עליהם להחזיקם ולהוותם וישלח להם מהר רפואה, רפואה שלמה מן השמיים, רפואת הנפש ורפואת הגוף. אשתא ועגלה ובזמן קרי. ונאמר בשם ישוע Amen. May the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bring blessing and healing to these who are in need. May the Holy One, blessed be He, be filled with compassion and restore them to health and strength, swiftly send them physical and spiritual and renewal, and let us say in the name of Yeshua, Amen. You may be seated. Is there anyone who is this week remembering the passing of a loved one, the anniversary of the recent passing? And I will say for Pam Carney, uh, most of you did not know Pam. Pam was a wonderful soul. Uh, had moved to Houston from Idaho simply because God had laid it on her heart to do so. Um, and also for Natasha's grandmother. Uh, her name was Kathleen. Is there anybody else? It gadal di it gadash ne rava, ve almam di rach ki rote, ve amlik malkate, ve chayekon, ve mechon, ve kai de gold de it Israel, ve agala u bisman kariv. Ebru? Amen. Yehesh ne rava, ne barak, ve alam, ve alme al mayak. It barak, ve istabak. Be Bahar, be Roma, be Nase, be Tadar, be Tale, be Talel, Shmena Kusha, Bariku, Leila, in Kol Bekata, Veshrata, Dush Bekata, Venekimata, the Amiran, the Alma, Mimru, Amen. Yehe, Shlama Rabba, Min Shmaya, the Kayim, Alenu, the Alkol Yisrael, Mimru, Amen. The Se Shalom, Ben Romav, Uya, Se Shalom, Alenu. We have called Israel, we groove, amen. And in English, glorified and sanctified be his great name in the world, which is created according to his will. May he cause the reign of his kingdom in your lifetime and in your days and in the life of all the house of Israel. Speedily, yes, soon, and say amen. May his great name be blessed forever and forever eternally. Blessed and praised. Glorified and exalted, extolled and honored, adored and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be He who is high and high, far beyond all blessings and hymns, praises and consolations that are spoken in the world, and say, Amen. May there be great peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. He who creates peace in His heavenly realms, may He make peace for us and for all Israel. And say, Amen. And I know that Natasha and Carter are watching this morning. So, Natasha, may your grandmother's memory always be for a blessing. Amen. There is no God like you, O Lord, and there are no deeds like yours. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. I deny you are king, you have always been king, and you shall be king forever and ever. Give strength to your people. Lord, bless your people with the peace that transcends human understanding. And let the words of Messiah Yeshua be greatly honored in Israel and throughout the earth. Father, compassion, do the Messiah according to your will. We build the walls of Jerusalem, for we trust in you alone, O King, Lord, exalted and uplifted, creator of the universe. Amen. All right, man. Thy heroes, thy men will say, Kumar, Adonai, thy fruits to Olena, they are good to me, Sanena, me, Vaneka, Ki, me, Sion, Tepse, Torah, Ki, me, Sion, Tepse, Torah, 
Bless the Lord who is blessed. 
Baruch Adonai Hamarach Le'olam Ba'ed. Bless the Lord of His flesh forever and ever. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam. Asher Bartar Badami Kol Ha'amim. Ve'nat Ha'olamet Torato. Baruch Atah Adonai. Notein HaTorah. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who chose us from all peoples and gave to us the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. <clears throat> he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May he bless you, Tom, Bar Michael, Ben Michael, who has come up in honor of the Holy One of Israel, the Torah, and the Shabbat. May the Holy One, blessed be He, reward you. May He guard you and rescue you from every trouble and distress, from every plague and illness. May He send blessing and success to all the works of your hands, together with all Israel, your brothers, and say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Exodus 19, verses 14 through 20. Moshe went down from the mountain to the people, and separated the people for God. And they washed their clothing. He said to the people, Prepare for the third day. Don't approach a woman. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood near the base of the mountain. Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke, because Adonai descended onto it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and God answered him with a voice. Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai, to the top of the mountain. Then Adonai called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim alem ta'olam Asher natam anu Torah temet Vekaye olam natal betochenu Baruch atah Adonai Elohim atah Amen Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and life everlasting planted in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Let me call it Megan. Baruch atah Adonai, Elohim Melech HaOlam, Asher Natan Anu Mashiach Yeshua, Vehadrim Chilbri Kadashah, Baruch atah Adonai, Notebri Kadashah, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the new covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless you, Megan Bud Glenn, who has come up in honor of the Holy One of Israel, the new covenant scriptures, and the Shabbat. May the Holy One, blessed be He, reward you. May He give you the desires of your heart and rescue you from every trouble and distress, from every plague and illness. May He send blessing and success to all the works of her hands, together with all Israel, her people, and say, Amen. We'll be reading from 1 Peter 1, verses 5 through 9. From Kitha, an emissary of Yeshua the Messiah, to God's chosen people living as aliens in the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, the province of Asia, and Bithynia. Chosen. Yeah. Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who in keeping with his great mercy has caused us, through the resurrection of, of Yeshua the Messiah, from the dead to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that cannot decay, spoil, or fade, kept safe for you in heaven. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, through trusting, you are being protected by God's power for a deliverance ready to be revealed at the last time. Rejoice in this, 
even though for a little while you may have to experience grief and various trials. Even gold is tested for genuineness by fire. The purpose of these trials is so that your trust genuineness, which is far more valuable than perishable gold, will be judged worthy of praise, glory, and honor at the revealing of Yeshua the Messiah. Without having seen him, you love him. Without seeing him now, but trusting in him, you continue to be full of joy that is glorious beyond words. And you are receiving what your trust is aiming at, namely, your deliverance. That's good stuff. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who gave us the word of truth and planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. 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 We'll go ahead and turn the scroll. Very interesting while they're putting this back together. It said that Moses went down and separated the people for God. Huh. He separated the people for God. Now that's there's a, a great teaching on that, but just to kind of make it real short and sweet, he separated the people for God because he came to give the word of God. And when we give the word of God to people, we are doing exactly what God wants us to do. Not making up our own spin on it, but just the pureness of the word of God which speaks for itself. Okay. <laughs> There is none like our God, there is none like our Lord, there is none like our King, there is none like our Deliverer. Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Deliverer? Let us give thanks to our God. Let us give thanks to our Lord. Let us give thanks to our King. Let us give thanks to our Deliverer. Blessed be our God. Blessed be our Lord. Blessed be our King. Blessed be our Deliverer. You are our God. You are our Lord. You are our King. You are our Deliverer. You are the one to whom our Father is offered up before you in fragrant incense. And when the ark rested, Moses would say, Return, O Lord, to the myriads of Israel's families. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and your mighty ark. Clothe your priest with righteousness. May those who experience your faithful love shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, don't delay and return to your side. I give you good instructions. Do not forsake my Torah. Blessed are you, Lord of God, ruler of the universe, who gave us the living word in the side of Yeshua. Amen. He is the living Torah.
It is our duty to praise the Master of all, to acclaim the greatness of the one who formed all creation. I do not, did not make Israel like other nations of the lands, and did not make Israel the same as other families of the earth. God did not place Israel in the same situations as others, and Israel's destiny is not the same as anyone else's. We bend our knees and bow down and give thanks to Adonai, the ruler of rulers, the Holy One. Blessed be He, the One who spread out the heavens and made the foundations of the earth, and whose precious dwelling is in the heavens above, and whose powerful presence is in the highest heights. Adonai is our God, there is none else. Our God is truth, and nothing else compares, as it is written in your Torah. And you shall know today, and take to heart, that Adonai is the only God in heaven above, and on the earth below. There is no other. Therefore we put our hope in you, Adonai our God, to soon see the glory of your strength, to remove all idols from the earth, and to freely cut out all false gods, to repair the world, your glorious kingdom. And for all living flesh to call your name, and for all the wicked of the earth to turn to you. May all the world's inhabitants recognize and know that to you every knee must bend, and every tongue must swear loyalty. Before you, Adonai, our God, may all bow down and give honor to your precious name, and may all take upon themselves the yoke of your kingdom. May you reign over all nations forever and always. Because all rule is yours alone, and you will rule and honor forever and ever. As it is written in your Torah, Adonai will reign forever and ever. And it is said, Adonai will be ruler of the whole earth. And on that day, God will be one, and God's name will be one. Yes. Come, let us go up to Zion. Let us draw near to the Lord our God. Come, let us go up to Zion. Let us draw near to the presence of the Lord.
Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the living God. Let the weight of your glory cover us. Let the light of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the weight of your glory let the weight of your glory fall. Spirit of the sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known we feel. The glory of the
this is going on to turn people's hearts to yearn for the glory of God. And I know y'all don't need me to tell you this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The glory does not show up to individuals. It shows up corporately. It shows up when we gather together. God does everything corporately. Okay, so this week, let's go ahead and get started. Our declaration. Turn it and turn it. Turn everything is in it. Turn it and turn it for Messiah. I just love that. And our second declaration. For every good and acceptable sacrifice, there is a divine response. God responds. Wow. Well, we are this week in Parshat Yitro. How many of you read the Parsha this week? Good. I would encourage everybody to read it every week. It's really great stuff. And I'll kind of get into that why a little bit later. So in Parsha Yitro, and you remember Yitro, in English, Jethro, you know, kind of like the guy on Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses. And so he, you remember, he had told his father-in-law, he'd seen the burning bush. One of the sages of Israel said that, the, that Moses being at the burning bush proved the greatness of God because he said, where you see the humility of God, you see the greatness of God. That's good. So he had seen it. He went back to Jethro, his father-in-law. He said, man, I've got to go. I've got to get out of here. And so Jethro, knowing, he said, well, if a God spoke to you, take off, go. So there's some things about Jethro, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Now, we know that the big event in Parashat Yitro is the giving of words. the Ten Words, commonly called the Ten Commandments. Now, that's coming off. Now, in Hebrew, it's called Debraya, which gets translated into the Ten Commandments in English. And this is one of the few times that the word Yah is used. Now, we say hallelujah, but when the word Yah is used, it's always in context of poetry or in song. And so this is one of the very few exceptions to Dibra Yah, the, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And this is really where you get to a point, everything that had happened up to this point was leading to this big event. This was an event that shook the world. This is an event that changed the world. As a matter of fact, it is written in the uh, oral law and in the Midrash that when God showed up on the mountain and, you know, it shook and the sound of the shofar and everything else, that everything stopped. You no know, birds were singing. Everything stopped because he had arrived on the scene, and the world responded with the shaking and everything else. So this was this was the turning point in what was leading up to redemption. When we got to the Ten Commandments, it's like, okay, now this is where it clicks, and this is where we start moving toward the final redemption, which we're still moving toward. Uh, you know, the flood was part of what led up to it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and everything that had happened, and then Israel going down into Egypt and the Passover and everything, it was all leading up to this moment. This was the greatest of God's creation, man, now receiving instruction where he can begin to fulfill the purpose that God had created man for. And it's very simply this. God created man to choose God and to create a home right here in the world for him. Now, that seems, you know, when you say that, it's like, but God is bigger than all creation. All creation can't hold him. But you remember also, we've talked about it before, there's that term, seems soon. 
which is what happened at the burning bush, that God reduces himself to where he can fit within time and space. And of course, the greatest example of Sing Zoom is Messiah Yeshua. So this was this was a massive thing that happened that man could now begin to work to make the world a home for God. But something had to happen first. And it's kind of unusual. Why is this called Parsha Yitro? Well, before the giving of the Debrayah, before the giving of the Ten Commandments, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, showed up and brought his brought Moses' wife and brought his two children. And he greeted him. All of these great things had happened. And uh, we know that in all of this, a great thing had happened before the giving of the Ten Commandments. And that is Jethro was converted. You know, Paul already knew the one true God. So it's, there's no conversion here. Peter, James, and all these guys didn't get converted. They just came to understand Yeshua is the Messiah. It's the Gentiles who get converted. Because we come into faith of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So anyway, okay, so he was a priest of Midian. He knew all sorts of gods. They had gods for this, gods for that, and everything else. Uh, and one in particular. Now, you may know that Keturah at one time had had another name. Her name before had been Hagar. And you know that Hagar was also the mother of Ishmael, who was pretty much the father of the Arabic peoples. And so Jethro was a descendant through because they took up the gods of the Moabites. Now, you know what the Bible says about the Moabites. Not exactly a, a, a holy people. And you remember Moab in Hebrew is Moab, which means from daddy. So that's kind of a bad start to begin with, you know? Not a great thing. So they took up the gods of the Moabites and as a pagan priest he knew all of these different gods, but as a descendant of Abraham, he also had to know about the God of Abraham. He had just been brought up with, you know, we've got all of these gods and you've got all these choices. You've got a god for sun, you've got a god for the rain, you've got moon, you've got a God for giving children, you've got a God for everything. But we know that Jethro, now being with Moses and being with the people of Israel, he said these words, now I know that Hashem is greater than all gods. And he became a man of the faith of the one true God. Yeah. Kind of peculiar though, he didn't stay with Israel. He ended up going back to his place. Which, you know, it's kind of like, hey man, what? you know these people worship the one true God. Why didn't you stick around with them? We also know that the Bible says that God has reserved prophets in the nations where they can also hear. So he became a prophet in the land of Midian, in the land of what is they Saudi Arabia, just like Balaam had been a prophet, and others from the nations had been prophets as well. So uh, here was this man who had a spiritual mindset of the people of Israel who had come out of Egypt. But by this conversion, he became a priest of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this was a great and important matter. And isn't it curious that until that took place, God did not give the Ten Commandments? Very curious. It's like, God, why didn't you choose to give them as soon as they crossed the river? God, why didn't you choose to just, you know, the night of Passover after they smeared the blood on them? How come you didn't just? You remember what God told Moses? When he saw the burning bush, I love this. He said, your sign that I have sent you will be that you will worship me on this mountain. Be converted first, and he had to go back home, and he had to take with him the message of the one true God. 
this is the beginning of the spreading of, of God's word throughout the world, the knowledge of the one true God. So they knew about God in Egypt. Now they're going to know about God in Midian and other places in that area. But with that, God gave the Debrayah to the people of Israel. And <coughs> to those who were who had left Egypt said, your God is the one true God, we're going with you. And would give it to them so that as the others had a knowledge of the one true God, now the people of Israel, whom God had said, I'm going to make you my chosen people and you will be a priesthood to the nations as well. This was preparing Israel to be the priesthood to the nations and for the nations to have an ear to hear about the word of God through the people of Israel. And so that hasn't changed. Uh, it's still God's calling. Well, um, so with all of that done, now I love the Hebrew for where it talks about where they camped at the base of the mountain. Because it says they camped, and in the same sentence, it says he camped. It had gone from being plural to being singular. The people of Israel were so united and so together as one people, it was as though it was one person there. And it was under that condition that God said, listen up, I'm about to give you my word. Well, uh, now, now Israel is, is purposed with working for redemption and the restoration of the world. And, and it's really no different today. As a matter of fact, why should we read the Torah portion? Because when we wake up in the mornings and we open up this word, it's, it's kind of like it is with Passover. Every year when we have Passover, what does it say in the Haggadah? You have to think of it as though you had been there yourself and you were set free yourself because we're tied in as one through the, through the ages. And so every day when we pick up this word and we read God's instructions, that's a little bit of Sinai that we have for ourselves. And I don't know about y'all, but I think that is a beautiful and wonderful thing to consider we can have a little bit of sight in our lives every single day. Prayer and obedience through Torah knowledge is part of this whole thing about the uh, work of redemption. And in effect, our calling is also to share our faith with the Jethro's of the world. Because right now, there are a lot of Jethro's that are out there who know all sorts of stuff about all other religions and things but they want to see the power of God in our lives. And so when they see the power of God in our lives, they're going to say, now I know that your God is the God and the only one. And, and that includes people who say, well, uh, yeah, my, my, my grandfather was a, a pastor. Yeah, I know the Lord. I don't act like it. Kind of a funny thing. I, I've never found in scripture where it says that God has grandchildren. All right. So let's take a look at the Debraya, Word of God. And we're going to go over this kind of quickly. The very first commandment. I am the Lord your God. Now this is obviously a very abbreviated version of it. I am the Lord your God. Now if you look at the Hebrew version of it and its English translation, and then you look at the Catholic version, and then you look at the Protestant version, you're going to see two different versions. Matter of fact, I think it's really even three different versions. Because in Christianity, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me, is the first commandment. But in reality, the first one is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's the first commandment. Okay, so what happens if we ignore the first one altogether? All the rest of them just don't mean a thing in the world, do they? It's the establishment. 
I am God. Listen to me. And we say, yes, sir. And the next one is no idolatry. No idolatry. One of the things that God said in this is, don't make an image of me. It didn't take long for that to be broken. Can I say something that might mess with some of you? Is that okay? Do we have in our homes pictures of Yeshua? Little paintings and or something like that? We believe that Yeshua is God. So if we have images of what we think he may have looked like in our home, <coughs> I said no images. Okay? Now, does that mean that we're worshiping them? We don't. But we also know that human tendency is, look at that. And we hold it in especially high regard. The Bible I had when I was a kid growing up had all sorts of cheesy pictures in it and everything else. I don't use that. Do not take his name in vain. Don't take his name in vain. What does that really mean? Well, that's kind of a you know, how do you define that? If you look at it, in Hebrew it says Lashava. Don't take his name casually. In other words, if you're going to use the name of God, have thought about it. Make sure that it's something that is purposeful, which is going to bring me, and I wasn't going to talk about this, but there are a lot of people who are trying to use a name for God, the Yud, Hey, the Bob, and the Hey, and nobody knows how to pronounce it. So if we try to pronounce that name, what we think it is, eh, maybe we're not giving it the thought that we should. Okay, next one. On to the Sabbath. I've got a quick question for everybody. I want somebody to answer this for me. How do you honor the Sabbath? Somebody, anybody? Your, your? Me here. Being here, observe, yeah, what does it mean though to observe it? To remember. To remember? That's what it says to remember. What, what does that mean? Rest. Say it again. Rest. You rest, meaning rest. you don't do what? Work. You don't work. Because when God gave the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, his first instruction was you take two beams at no. His first instruction was you don't do this on the Sabbath. And so what the people of Israel had to do is they had to look at this and figure out, we've got to determine what work is. And so anything that was done to build the tabernacle on the Sabbath, and there are 39 of those things, and they said, that's work, we don't do that on Shabbat. Now, hang on a minute. Every Shabbat, when we leave here, we get together, or before we leave, we get together, we eat and stuff, do we just leave a mess in there? And we clean the place up. Are we violating God's word in doing that? Now this is where it gets to be, what do we do here? There are two categories of work, and Yeshua himself backs this up. There is regular work that we do, and then there is holy work. Are we supposed to say, for example, after synagogue, we're supposed to go somewhere and get something to eat? And spend money getting something to eat? No, because we're making somebody else work on Shabbat. But what if somebody's starving? And you see that somebody on Shabbat, he's starving. What do you do, Tater? You take him somewhere and you get him something to eat. It's like Troy says, and he just said it, it's the greater good. And so there is work that is considered holy work, and then there is work that is profane work. So when we clean the place up after Shabbat, that's taking care of this place that is set aside for the purpose of God. So that's okay. All right, next. Honor your father and mother. Okay, not everybody understands that. Next, do not murder. No matter how much you really, really want to, don't murder somebody. <laughs> Not a good thing. Don't commit adultery. You have made a covenant.
to be one with that person. And it's not Steve and Bill. I don't care what our government is saying. I don't care what our president is saying. And I don't care if they hear this either. It's a man and a woman. Period. Do not steal. Don't take something that doesn't belong to you. That's pretty easy. Do not bear false witness. Now, is that the same thing as don't tell a lie? Ooh, wait a minute now. Is it same? How many of you would say it's not the same thing as telling a lie? I would say it. If it's 1941 and you live in Holland and you talk to you funny, somebody knocks on your door, are you hiding Jews here? God be upset. If you're hiding Jewish people there, is it okay to lie? You bet. That's not bearing false witness against somebody. That's protecting lives. Again, you know, Troy says it's the greater good. All right? So don't, in other words, don't run and yang, yang, yang and tell lies about somebody to hurt that person's reputation. I remember one time at this. I remember one time I'd been at a wedding of some people years ago and bless her heart, you know, you know, you know in the South when you say bless her heart, yeah, yeah, somebody said, oh, isn't she beautiful? And she was a very nice girl. She was very nice. And I said, yes, she is. And I'm going to leave it at that. Bless her heart. And the final one, do not covet. I, I, well, what does covet mean? Don't covet. Covet is not a word we use in English a whole lot. Covet means Michael has a Harley Davidson motorcycle that he rides. And I want it so badly, I'm going to find a way to get it from him. That's what covet is. If I see Michael riding on a Harley, I say, man, I like that. I sure wish I had one. That's not coveting. Coveting means you, you're trying to find a way to get something from somebody that he owns, which can also get back to don't commit adultery. Adultery is killing at least two of the commandments. Okay? So we have these here, and I'm going to go to what Yeshua said. One of the Pharisees went to Yeshua and said, which is the greatest commandment? And I just love Yeshua's answer. He said, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the other one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you take a look at, this, at the tablets here, what do we have here on this side? Love God. And over here, we have love your neighbor. Now, you kind of look at it and say, wait a minute, wait, what about honor your father and mother? One of the great things that we learn from our parents is how to relate to God. Because our parents are to demonstrate to us what it is to love God. But also, it's kind of a turning point also for the rest of them, which means if we say we love God and we don't love our neighbors, what are we doing? John said so. He said, we're doing what? We're lying. <clears throat> if we say we love God and don't love our neighbors, we are liars. So, love God, love your neighbor. Now, here's the thing. Are there only ten commandments? There's 613 of them. But you know what you find out? Every single commandment fits in one of these. Somewhere along the way. Okay? Passover. You'd eat matzah for seven days. Where does that fit? I'm the Lord your God. You do so because I say so. There you go. Or how about the commandment that says you build a fence around the top of your roof? 
Which one is that? Okay. That's love your neighbor. Yeah, it all fits. So when Yeshua said the two greatest commandments, the reality of it is what Yeshua is saying, keep what? Keep the Torah. Keep as much of it as we possibly can. Okay, now we can't... Sometimes you hear people say, oh, I'm Torah observant. That's impossible. And it will always be impossible as long as there's not a temple. Okay? I want to say something here. And I want to say it with caution. Because I don't want it to sound like I'm attacking anybody. Some of the biggest names in Christianity today, not only are they saying, and I'm going to use the Christian terminology here, not only are they saying that Jesus Christ came along to do away with the law, he even did away with the Ten Commandments. And I mean some really, really, really big names in Christianity are saying that. All right, well, let's, let's examine that from that perspective. He's not the Lord our God. You shall commit idolatry. You shall take his name in vain. You shall not honor the Sabbath. You shall not love your mother and father. You shall murder. You shall commit adultery. You must steal. You must lie against your neighbor. And you must covet. The reality of it is, when they're saying this, what they're saying is, Yeshua lied when he said the two greatest commandments are love God, love your neighbor. Now, do I think they're lying on purpose? I don't. I don't think they're lying on purpose, but they have been handed this down generation after generation. Hey, I was there. I was there at one time because I, I was taught that. And then kind of a weird thing happened. I actually started reading the Bible for myself. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, gee, we, we say these things and we believe this. Where did this come from? Then you get into the history of it, you find out, okay, the lies started many, many, many. As a matter of fact, what did Paul say to the Romans? He said, eh, 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 you're not greater than the tree that you've been grafted into. Oh, I'm going to tell another quick story here. My brother, Kirk Mayer, and I, one time, were asked to go and blow the shofars at the National Day of Prayer. So we agreed to it. Kirk's Jewish, I'm not. And while we were there, a guy who was one of the organizers of it came back there and he saw us. We had our shofars, we had our uh, kippo, we had our tally tote. He said, wow, you guys are here. This is great. Yeah, thank you. So... You guys believe in Jesus? Yes. Well, oh, this is great. You're part of the church. And Kurt said, no. The guy looked at him. He said, but you believe in Christ? He said, we believe in the Messiah. He said, so say you're part of the church. Kurt just shook his head, no. The guy was standing there looking at us like we had two heads. I said, let me help to explain something to you. And the reality of what Scripture says, Gentiles like you and me are grafted in to Israel. We belong to Israel and with Israel because we belong to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of Messiah Yeshua. He kind of looked. Didn't say anything, just walked away. I thought, well, maybe one of these days it'll kind of dawn on him a little bit, you know? And so... You know, people who are listening to these guys saying, oh, even the Ten Commandments are done away with, they really need to get away from those people. They need to go somewhere else. May it be so. Okay, so now, after the giving of the Ten Commandments, Israel would be given the task of building the tabernacle and bringing forth the priesthood, which is you know, what you you saw in chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And so here are the people. Now they've heard these words. And they're saying, oh, man, this is no. They were terrified. 
they had heard the voice of the Creator of heaven and earth, and they were scared out of their wits. And I don't know about y'all, but I have no problem understanding that one little bit. It's a frightening thing. And, and incidentally, every time God speaks to humanity within time and space, whose voice is it? That's Yeshua's voice. Every single time, because he was there from the beginning. He is God. So the fear is going to have to be turned into awe. And so now they are prepared to become the nation of priests. I want to take a look at Exodus 20, 15 through 18. So and keep in mind, they're terrified here. All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. And by the way, the word experience there is here. They heard the thunder. They heard the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and they heard the mountain smoking. Wow. Something happened beyond the reality of where we live. Did God let them experience something a little bit extra to hear lightning, to hear all of these things? Standing in the distance, they said to Moshe, you speak with us and we will listen. Don't let God speak to us or we will die. Boy, they really trusted Moshe a lot. Moses, Moses don't you let God speak to us. Boy, Moshe answered the people, don't be afraid because God has come only to test you and make you fear him so that you won't commit sins. So the people stood at a distance. But Moshe approached the thick darkness where God was. Moshe Nigash. I just had to throw this in. Moses approached Nikra is, is to approach. Moses was brought to the presence of God. He didn't go under his own power. He was brought to the presence. So here's Moses telling everybody, don't be afraid. But I sure don't want to go in that cloud. But what happened, was that all of those? Okay, so what happened is, now God is going to show them you can approach God and you can live. You remember earlier God said, you tell them, set boundaries around it. Don't just come up on your own, but then I'm going to tell you when you can come up. In other words, he was telling them, you sanctify the ground where you stand. So here, pretty much what he's saying is that he elevated the people. And in order for us to be elevated, we have to get beyond our own fears. We have to get beyond our own reservations and everything else and to be prepared to be used of God. Um, a healthy fear is a good thing too, by the way. So Israel had no idea what God had in store for them. All they knew is God spoke and they said, whatever he says, we're going to do. They said, we will do and we will hear. So now the veil is getting partially pulled back, and soon they're going to be able to understand. And the immediate instruction here, right afterwards, the first thing was not about building the tabernacle. It was about when you make an offering. I just, I think that's marvelous. I want to take a look at Exodus 20, 19, and 21 to continue. Before anything else, Adonai said to Moshe, here is what you were to say to the people of Israel. This is when he went inside the darkness. And when he came out, that's when the people would say, I can do this. Adonai said to Moshe, here is what you were to say to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I spoke with you from heaven. You are not to make gods, uh, not to make with me gods of silver, nor are you to make gods of gold for yourselves. For me, you need to make only an altar of earth. On it, you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, peace offerings, sheep, goats, and cattle. In every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and I will bless you. Now, there had been experiences with darkness before. So here's Moses in this darkness. You remember when Abraham sacrificed those animals and, and God said, do this and spread them out and I'm going to come to you? Darkness fell, and he was terrified. 
but God brought him out of it. You remember the Egyptians had darkness, and a lot of people died because of that darkness. And so this darkness is not something that has to be feared on our level if we apply the faith to it. So here he is saying, you make these offerings and you do it on an altar of earth. By the way, had God even given instructions on making offerings yet? No. It's like, okay, what do you mean make offerings? That's when they had to look back to the past because as children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had made offerings. Who was the first person in Scripture to give an offering? Anybody know? First two people, I should say. Cain and Abel. Well, isn't that curious? Because there's no instruction for Cain and Abel to do it either. But somehow they knew because really the very first offering had been made by Hashem himself to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. But here he's saying you make an altar of earth. So it's very important to know and to see that this offering, which was going to allow people to draw near to God, was done before the building of the tabernacle, an altar of earth. Now, once the tabernacle was made, and once the altar was built, you could not sacrifice anything anywhere else with one exception. Does anybody know what the one exception is? This is really cool. There's only one offering that you could not give, or sacrifice that you could not make within the compound of the tabernacle, and that's, say it? No, it's the red heifer. The red heifer. Because the sacrifice of the red heifer would be used to cleanse the ground where the tabernacle was going to be put. So one day, before the temple is rebuilt, we're going to see the appearance of the red heifer again. That's a big thing to keep an eye on for. Okay, I'm getting off of my message here. So, what about for today? Living out God's word the best that we possibly can. We have the Torah. Israel is still God's chosen people. That's never going to change. Israel is still a nation of priests. That's not going to change. And there are still Gentiles who are being brought in and grafted in. But the temple's gone. No sacrifices can be made. Well... I'm not talking about the red heifer either. Perhaps we can make sacrifices today. And I'll get to that here in Uno Momento. The, uh, the temple, when the temple was built, if you go and you read in 1 Kings about the building of the temple, you see that the windows were actually reversed. They used to build the windows to where the inside was, uh, the inside was wide and the outside was narrow, like that. But it was exactly the opposite in the temple. The, outs the outside was wider than, than... Okay, I'm getting confused here. I'm sorry. I need to go back and look at it. Anyway, the idea was, with others, light from outside was allowed in. Yeah, the narrower and the wider. But with the temple, it was reversed because the glory that was inside the temple shown through that, and it was a visible thing. People can actually see the glory even in the daylight. Okay? And why am I bringing this up? What does this have to do with living out the Ten Commandments and the sacrifice of altar on the earth? Since the temple has been destroyed, the sages of Israel say that the glory that was there in the temple has been scattered throughout the earth. And it's in sparks everywhere around the world. And of course, what we want to see happen is we want to see those sparks regathered so that again, the temple will be rebuilt so that when the temple is rebuilt, well, we know Yeshua is going to reign for that thousand years from the temple itself. And so the sooner that gets built, the sooner we're going to see Messiah Yeshua return. Now, there are some who disagree with that, and that's okay. We all have the right to be wrong. We can talk about it later. Um, so the cloud represents the glory that was on the temple. Well, 
uh, believers in Yeshua actually believe the same thing, that the glory of God is spread throughout the earth and that Messiah will rule from the temple itself. Now, we also know that when the temple is rebuilt, the sacrifices are going to resume. If you go to Zechariah chapter 14, Ezekiel, and other places, it makes it abundantly clear that when the temple is rebuilt for the last time, the sacrifices will resume and are going to be made again. Uh, but now, what about now? There is no blood sacrifice except for the red heifer. But we do have access to make sacrifice of a sort, an altar of earth. An altar of earth. And we can't go and just build an altar of earth in our homes and you know, we've got goats go out there and sacrifice. We can't do that. But you go back to Genesis and we find out that our bodies are made from the earth. Okay? And since our bodies are made from the earth, there's something significant in all that. I want to take a look at Romans 12, 1 through 2. And this was rent, written to mostly Gentile believers. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. Our sacrifices today, our bodies are the altar. The lives that we have locked up in here are the sacrifice because we become living sacrifices. And it, God's word is called a flaming fire. And it's that word that should be just the light of our lives. This will please him. It is a logical temple worship for you. In other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you'll always know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. And there's only one thing that's going to do that in our minds and in our lives. The two greatest commandments. Love God love your neighbor. In order for these things to take place, we've got to understand keeping as much of the Torah as we possibly can, walking it out in our lives, and proclaiming the name of Messiah Yeshua. That's our experience on the mountain. That's our experience at Sinai. And God said, when you do, I will come to you and I will bless you. So, the greater we know his word, the greater the sacrifice, and the greater our witness. And it causes his name to be mentioned, and he loves that. And this is our sign to the Jethro's of the world. And it's also the sign that the God of Israel is the only God, and Messiah is Israel's only king. And that is a great thing to be considered on a beautiful Shabbat night like this. I want to tell you all, Darlene and I are so very thankful to get to walk this out with y'all. We really are. We love y'all. and Just ask God to bless y'all all the time. And to be able to have a place like this to walk this out is a great blessing to us. All right. I think I'm going to stop there. I had some other things that I was going to say, but I think I'm just going to stop right there. All right. You don't alarm. Don't alarm or share my life. But there in cold, it's here in the Iraq. Lay in the sun with lips of cold. As I may let you bone me cry. The arms are raking, clothes are cold. Levado, you blow the aura. A who haya, the who hove. A who ye beti fara, the who echad. Ain't she me? Leham Shilo, Lehaf Nihira, Beli Rashid, Beli Tathlit, Velo Haos, the Hamis Rava, the Hueli, the Thangoli, Betsur Hevli, Bet Zahara, the Hundi Si, Humanos Li, Benat Kosi, Beome Krava, Beado of Kidruhi. Ben Isham Be'ahira Be'im Ruhi Gevi'ati 
Lord of the world, the King is reigning before all creation came to be. When by his will all things were wrought, the name of our King was first made known. And when his day shall cease to be, he still shall reign in majesty. He was, he is, and he will be all glorious eternally. Incomparable, the Lord is one, no other can his nature share, without beginning, without end. To him all strength and majesty. He is my living God who saves, my rock in grief or sorrow's fall, my banner and my refuge strong, my hunt of life whenever I call. And in his hand I place my life, both when I sleep and when I wake. And with my soul and body too, God is with me. There is no fear. Thank you. Hallelujah. All right, we've got a few announcements real quickly. The Sadaka box is back there for offerings. Next. Uh, you want to talk about this? It's pretty much on there. Okay. It's three weeks from tomorrow. Three weeks We're from tomorrow. Ralph and Mindy said are going to be here. Yeah. Be and fun. yeah, 12 to 5, a $10 fee. And they teach Messianic dance, and let me tell you, they are quite good at it. And then we'll have all their, their CDs and DVDs. Here too. Yeah. Want to buy any of them, so, so invite your friends. Home. Yeah, they'll be here. It's here. It's right here at the, at the synagogue. So invite your friends, invite your neighbors, invite people you don't like. Maybe you'll <laughs> maybe you'll get to be friends. Anybody that loves to dance. Yeah. You know, these people are so sweet and precious. They are just and I, I don't even know if they let people just come and watch. If you don't want to dance with them, I could just come and watch. Yeah. Sure. Ask, but I, anyway, it's gonna be a good time. All right, ten dollar fee. Uh, your financial meeting that is next Shabbat after the service, and this is for members and regular givers only. And it's going to you, you'll get to see what God has done through Congregation Beth Simca, and I'm pretty excited about it. Next, full on day, woohoo! Not Dairy Queen, full meal. All right, next, Brucha. <laughs> she asked me, she says, Michael gonna do it today? I said, Yeah. She's okay. Thank you, Don <laughs> Blessing over the one. In the name of Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Let's give them a few minutes to get everything ready. Shabbat shalom. everybody. You're all welcome to come sometime.